meaning we the elected officials already know who's lobbying everything like we don't need this bill and of course the response is you know has it occurred to you this isn't about you <laughs> and and that that was a showstopper for you know for what was there but with that came the realization that on that particular bill something else was done differently because given the role of the media and given some grassroots efforts in organizing the bill that had bipartisan dislike um, grew legs and when it came time for a hearing there was so much interest because the general public really did feel that they had a right to know who was getting paid to have what kind of influence on every piece of public policy in Colorado because the people believed that. That hearing room was packed and it was packed with cameras and some of those very same people who told me how much they hated that bill and they wanted it to die changed their votes in that moment because of the people who were there they had to look people in the eye who you know they suddenly saw a mirror of how appalling it would look to tell people they shouldn't have this basic right to know who's trying to impact public policy in the system. And in that moment between media exposure and by having lots of witnesses and lots of public attention, it survived the hearing. It was going to die in hearing. It passed hearing. It was going to die on the floor. The pressure was kept on the floor. It made it to the next step. It made it to the next chamber. That hearing was packed on the way through. We had a governor where there was a, a different political alignment at the time, and so we were different political parties and I was going uh oh I'm in trouble this one's gonna get vetoed and you know we made it this far it's too bad it's gonna get vetoed same thing actually because of the public scrutiny in a bipartisan way on this it became too much of a liability to actually veto this bill and the improbable happened and the little train that could you know I mean it happened it really happened all the way through on the most improbable thing all the way through the process and I tell you that because that is but one example in a moment where I realize a bill that gets regular citizen participation, in that moment the citizens outpowered all 1,100 paid lobbyists in the state. And it's important for people to know they can do it. Because people have said, and that's why I write this book, because it is not uncommon, you can imagine, for people to go, well, government is messed up. It is corrupt. What difference can I make? Why should I bother? Is it going to make an impact? Is anyone going to read my email? Isn't it already taken over by special interests anyway? So I tell you because I've seen the difference between when people do get involved and when they don't get involved. It makes all the difference in the world. And life is too short to run for office and do these things and not actually insist on things working um, really the best they can. So to, to the question of why be involved, I've been thinking about this just more on a basic level of, is government a we or is it an it? Because if it's an it, you attack it. You can dismember it. You can dissect it. You can hate it. But if it's a we, then there is a shared social sense of responsibility in a democracy to make it work. And until we really figure out where we're at on that, you have more work to do if you think it's a we. Because your work, as soon as you elect whoever your preference is at whatever level of government that's there, your job is not done, it's just beginning. And there's a serious price to doing nothing. I would bring that up. That if for every citizen that sits out, for every time someone basically hopes someone else is going to represent their interest or someone else has given up, there's a very serious cost to doing nothing. Because think of it like a proxy vote. Anytime you're absent from the conversation, there's a certain core number of professional paid lobbyists that are there every day working certain interests. And who can afford a lobbyist? The system is skewed, of course, towards those who can afford one. So certain industries and certain interests have greater presence than other people. There really isn't a tenant's lobby. There really is, you know, there's, a, and even where you have some nonprofit interests, they are very small compared to some of the other interests that are going on. They have a First Amendment right to be there. But the result you get, just the difference between choosing to participate and not, not basically, of course, means you're handing your proxy over to the disproportionate majority of the folks that are there. So we know that that's dysfunctional. And the more positive way of saying this is that your input actually works. 
And I've seen this, not just in the example of where I've given, but there have been huge David and Goliath issues, and sometimes they take two years, and sometimes they take three years. And I've worked on bills that have taken me five years to get through. So granted, we have to shelve anything that's necessarily looking for immediate, immediate gratification, but it works, and I've seen it work repeatedly because of this. Out of about 800 or so bills, you know, anywhere between six and 800 bills that we get per year, you will get citizen testimony input on maybe 20. And the more typical thing that we will see in a hearing when we show up is um, lobbyists that testify and no citizens or no witnesses. It's not that we don't sometimes have citizens that show up, but it's not on most bills. The overwhelming majority of bills that go through will never get citizen input. And I want to flag this for one of the most important tools that we have in Colorado for advocacy that most states don't have. You have a constitutional right to testify in this state on any bill. Every bill must get a public hearing. That is not true in Congress at the federal level. It is not true in most states. In most states, if the chairperson doesn't like you, pocket veto, your bill never gets a hearing, it dies before it's ever had a chance to hear the light of day. But from a grassroots perspective, particularly in this state, you can do the outside-in approach. You can be the check and balance to the professional paid lobby corps for what is there. And I've actually seen that change the outcome uh, several times. So a couple tips. So that's my why. And if you're here, you probably already know why. You think it's important to participate. But a couple tips, and then um, I wanted to um, see if I could get my colleagues to come join me in a little bit. But so I had some thoughts on maybe some of the common mistakes I see. And this is just from my perspective, because I think we can learn from mistakes. And some are small and some are big. But one mistake is to think this is all or nothing. It can be very time consuming. There's versions of doing this, which can be um, your whole out passion and consume all of your free time. And maybe this is what you choose to spend a ton of time doing. But it does not have to be all or nothing. One of the chapters that's in here are advocacy tips for busy people, a whole list of things that people can do in less than 10 minutes a year that actually still have an impact. So one of the first mistakes I see is I realize people are busy. They have lives, lives that have real challenges in them. And so it's not always realistic to expect that people can have basically a full-time citizen job on doing this. It's why it is important to realize that some quick things you can do in less than 10 minutes, your phone call does matter. It gets logged. It's how we know what kind of feedback or support or opposition we give from the public. Your email, you can, I mean, that can be even less than five minutes of what's there. But your email actually does make a difference. We keep those, we track those, we file them in the bill folders for what we get. Sometimes a lack of response can be taken if we have silence on a bill. It can be taken as acquiescence or consent or you agree with the majority of who's working the bill, but the public may not even know what's happening. Because your input, whether it's in live testimony, by phone call, or by email, is inherently unique and different from the majority of what we get, it stands out. So it's a mistake to think it's all or nothing. Um, the other mistake would be to assume all legislators or elected officials are the same. They're not. And so like you, I think one of the first things to really be effective is to just realize we're people like everybody else. Um, <clears throat> strengths and weaknesses, we have egos, we have feelings, we have things we care more about, we have our faults, we have all these things. And so if, if, if elected officials are all painted with one brush, just like any area of persuasion, you're going to be less effective. So all you elected officials do blah, 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 fill in the blank. Probably not a great way to get in there. So the, the reverse of that is, of course, like anything else, it's an exercise in psychology. And if you have time, do a little bit of digging to find out some of the specific quirks of who's there, what makes them tick, what is their background, what makes them work. Because you can always frame your persuasive message catered specifically to the audience and the legislator whose vote you really want to get on legislation that you want to pass or not. So again, just the mistake of thinking that all the all elected officials are the same. Um, I think one of the trickier things that's easy to miss is bill deadline. This is a little bit technical. Um, you may come to me in March with a fabulous idea for a bill, and our legislative session runs January to May. 
If you come to me in March, my deadlines are all passed. So it will be the following legislative cycle before I have a chance to even try to work with you on doing legislative reform. So there is a bill calendar, and in our state specifically for Colorado, there's one that actually breaks down the year's worth of deadlines on what's there. So you can see when the first, we have phases. So we have to reserve a title first, and then we have to have it introduced by a certain date. It is an unbelievably powerful tool for you as a citizen to know when those dates are. The general feedback I'd tell you is really between June and November for this state is the very best time to approach any legislator with an idea if you have a bill idea you want passed. If it's a new idea and you're not just simply weighing in as to whether you like or don't like an existing bill that's in, that gives us time to research, that gives us time to try and build a coalition uh, with you and that also gets it into the deadline. So just it's one page PDF, but it is worth downloading because your strategy um, can be very much more effective or not if you wind up losing a timing cycle on the bills. Um, I would just say I don't think anyone here would do anything like this, but another mistake is kind of angry and insulting. A lot of times people, even if it's understandable, wait until they're just really furious and they're at their wit's end by the time they're contacting. And it's like, Anything that you see with the, you know, how could you be so stupid or what are you thinking or even if you're right, <laughs> I can promise you those aren't very effective. I mean, um, because we are people, um, it, just like you, if someone approached you in that tone, it kind of gets your guard and your defenses up like that. And it's not hugely common, but you see it enough where e someone may have a very legitimate point or message and it really because of the human side of who your elected officials are, they're going to hear that, and whatever they really have to say is frankly not going to get heard past that. Um, simple thing, but failing to include your contact information. I get calls or emails, and people may not find them, uh, or I get a voicemail message, and they forget to leave a phone number on where I can call them back. This may sound completely obvious, but sometimes it's so it might feel just unnatural enough to be leaving the message that you might lose your place. I would recommend writing out a very short script of what you want to say, whether it's live or in script, just so you don't get thrown off by what's there. Make sure that you include your name, your contact information, and what you're asking for. Another mistake I often see is that there can be a very compelling story or somebody that, but it's not clear what, it, what is the, what would you like us to do? Would you like us to do some research? Would you like the law changed on this? Are you need, are you wanting some help with executive branches? Um, maybe you don't know what you want us to do, but then it's helpful to say, can you help me brainstorm with this and see if you have any ideas about how we could solve this problem? Probably the least effective way to be contacted is in, 10 pages with no paragraphs and no breaks, and at the end it doesn't say like what, you, what someone is looking for. That is very hard, given a very um, con condensed schedule to figure out, okay, what am I supposed to do with this? So the reality is, is that, you know, your audience is a multitasking, you know, 800 bill reading, many of us working two jobs kind of thing, and so if you can get it to a page or less, you can use your paragraph breaks, use your subject lines wisely so that we can tell. I'm asking, please support Senate Bill 1. Please oppose Senate Bill 10, that kind of thing. Um, on the, uh, just sort of on the positive thing, just your, the first impressions really do matter. Um, hopefully, you're not going to weigh in once. And if you come off strange the first time through, again, like the angry example for what's there, it's going to be very hard for you to come back um, and keep trying to work with someone on issues that you have. So um, maybe running something past a second opinion, um, bef basically getting someone else's second opinion on trying to figure out your best angle and your best approach because you really only do get that chance to make a first impression once. Um, stock sheets. This is something, there's a couple advantages lobbyists have over you, and I'll tell you what they are very quickly. Um, information is the premium by which we operate. And if you're not there, all of you are experts because of your life, because of your work, because of your school. If you're not there, a large amount of the information we're going to get is going to be fact sheets generated by paid lobbyists. And as you can imagine, those may not always be the most impartial documents we're going to see. So simply having even a one page, even as Joe or Jane citizen, Here's why I support this bill or oppose this bill. Here's three reasons. Maybe here's a couple, if you have resources, 
if you have, um, because of trade publications, if you have data, if you come into reports, get us good data. Because the more information we get from more sources, the better, the better the outcome. And you should not necessarily assume that we have or know everything you do. And the worst that happens, if it's a duplicate, we can handle that. So it's always helpful to us to basically get additional sources of, of research and information. And even if it's not on a specific bill, you are helping us out. If a publication comes out that you think is particularly relevant, send it to us. Um, just err on the side of sending that on the way through. And finally, I would just say meeting your legislator. You know, before, um, there's obviously a lot more in here that can go on the tips for what's there, but before I ran for office, I didn't know any of my elected officials, and it wasn't because I didn't care or because I wasn't involved. I read the news. I, was part I, you know, I participated in the way I did, but I thought that's something other people did. I thought you had to be connected. I thought, I, you know, I wasn't famous or connected or important enough, and so I just didn't feel like I was on an inside track, and it never really occurred to me that I had a right to sit down and actually ask to have a cup of coffee, uh, you know, to uh, try and get a meeting. Personal relationships here, that's, what, that's part of what makes the lobbyists so effective because their job is to become our very best friends and then it, it's, it's a relationship, you know, it's on the strength of a relationship. Well, that's partly human nature. So to the extent you can become a first name person that we know and I know your story and I know why you're coming at something for a particular, so when you come back to me, a long-term investment, I know that you have a really strong background in this area and that you have life experiences that are helpful and then you can become advisors to us. Then I'll know, oh, you know, I really need to call this person because they have this particular background and we can affirmatively go out and find you. So last tip I'd say on that is in session and out of session is very different on our scheduling. In session is very crazed and so to be realistic with you, we're talking about maybe five-minute deal. Out of session, however, we have more flexibility. And so it may still only be a half an hour, but do it. And, and besides knowing who represents you in each of your layers of government for what is there, it is most effective if you do it before you have anything particular even asking for. I just wanted to let you know I'm a constituent. I live in your district. I've been an educator for 25 years. I've worked in special education. I've worked with kids in this. I've worked across school districts. Let me tell you what I'm seeing. If any issues ever come up on education, I hope you'll keep me in mind. And then if, say, an education bill comes up before, that time with you, that one-on-one -on -one with you is going to, that gives me other resources to help us make better public policy. And then when you come to me, I now think you are a good, credible source of someone who lives in my district. So the weight of what gets assigned is heavier after we've met than, for example, an email by itself. So with that, because I want to make sure we leave lots of times for questions, um, I figured I'd make both Representative Field and uh, Ryden available for questions on that, but I wanted to specifically ask Representative Fields if you'd be willing to join me for a minute. The, the book has, besides how-to chapters on the way through, it's interspersed with some real-world stories of citizens who maybe never thought that they were going to get involved and did wind up getting involved. And one of these stories you're going to see featured in the book is the story of Rhonda Fields. <laughs> so, let her tell Thank you. <laughs> I am so glad she's my senator. <laughs> and I look up to you. And thank you for being such a great role model. And um, like um, Senator Carroll has mentioned before, I didn't know who my representative or senator was. You know, I just saw myself as just an average working class woman. I was really kind of minding my own business, paying taxes and just doing what I thought I needed to do for my family. And then all of a sudden, a tragedy happened in my life. I lost my son due to murder. And I was outraged because my son was doing the right thing. He was going to testify for a murder that he witnessed. And in the course of him testifying, he lost his life. And so I felt like the DA should have protected him. They should have offered him witness protection. And then when I mentioned that to the DA, I was told that he never asked for it. And that was just like a, it pierced my heart when I heard that because at the time he was 19 years old. He um, had just graduated from Colorado State University 
and we were from a, a, a community, you know, we didn't understand that element in society that there's evil people out there and bad things happen to this extent that you would be murdered for participating in our criminal justice system. And the DA that you're trying to help would tell you he never asked for help. I was outraged by that because how is he at 19 years old supposed to know that when he's carrying 15 credits at Colorado State University trying to get his degree. And he did graduate with a degree in speech communication and rhetoric. So when that happened, of course, my world was devastated. I was uh, just really shaken up. Our whole family was shaken. But I felt like I had to do something. I had to do something. And I was amazed at how accessible my representative was. And so what I did, and the timing just all worked out, because I, I called my representative, and I told him about my story, and I told him what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was to kind of strengthen the laws to protect witnesses in our state, because I felt like it was just, um, his rights were violated because no one told him about a witness protection program. So at the time, it was uh, uh, Representative uh, Michael Garcia. I met with him. And we met with the speaker at the time, it was uh, Andrew Rom Romanoff. And we talked about, we collaborated along with uh, Terrence Curl. What is the best language to um, strengthen Colorado's witness protection program? And it took a while. They said, let's do some research. Um, the people down at the Capitol, it's amazing, because they have these people in all these little covered holes down there. <laughs> and they were able to cobble up, this is what, California is doing, and this is what Maryland is doing, and this is what Colorado is not doing. And we were able to see that there was some huge gaps in reference to what the state is not doing to protect witnesses. And I just have to just tell you that when we came up with the bill, it passed the first, it passed out of committee, it passed second reading, it passed third reading, it passed the Senate, and within the same year that I met with my representative, by July, it was signed into law, and I, and I met with Michael Garcia, I think it was like in January or February, and it moved kind of rapidly, and I think that has a lot to do with me taking interest enough in what was going on in my government to try to make sure that another person, another mother, wouldn't have to lose their child to a tragedy like that, and I just got great response just by calling my representative, making an appointment, and that it happened. And I didn't just do that once, I did it twice. So after we got the bill named, uh, uh, passed, it was named after my son. And the bill is, is called Javad Marshall Fields and Vivian Wolf, because it was a double homicide, Witness Protection Program. And basically what that bill does, it, it makes sure that um, anyone who um, is a witness, gets advised of the rights about the witness protection program. And then it also has a risk assessment tool that's associated with it, which means that the witness understands the element of risk that's involved in being a witness. And they get um, a briefing in reference to how to safeguard yourself when you engage into the criminal justice system when you're dealing with a, a crime of that magnitude. That's a wonderful thing that I can look back and say that I passed that legislation as a citizen. You have great power. You have more power than the lobbyists that are down there. All you have to do is exercise your voice and exercise your, your power through your representative. I mean, those are the kind of bills that I want to carry, is when someone brings to me a problem that affects their ability or affects their um, yeah, their ability to do what they think is right in our community. So if you see something that is not right, that needs to be fixed, then it's kind of your responsibility to let us know about that. In the course of me, as a citizen, passing two bills, look at me now. <laughs>
and they just told the same story that I told them because of this and this and that. So we all have power in us that we just really need to tap into and we need to make sure that we hold our elected officials accountable for things that we think need to be addressed in this community and in this state. So actually what I, I love about Rhonda's story is, see, this is also contagious. It can become very addictive to participate, and sooner or later you find yourself, uh-oh, you know, you're looking around for, well, I'm not really seeing the candidate that I like the best, and you might look in the mirror and realize that's you as well. And if actually if I can keep Sue and Rhonda both up here, because we'll go ahead and open it up for questions, but also one of the first times that I was dealing with Sue, who is now also a state legislator, she was working on a Kids First license plate, but it's really a funding mechanism to deal with uh, children's issues there too. So you better be careful, otherwise you're going to wind up in elected <laughs> office if you're, not, if you're not careful. But what I wanted to do is make each of us available to you and start opening it up with any questions. Anything you want to know about the process, how can we help? Yes? For all three of you, to what extent have you seen or you see right now that political paradigm shifting to monolithic voting so if you're a member of this party, I don't care what lobbyists come in, I don't care what citizens come in, you have to vote this way or there'll be repercussions to your career. Are you seeing that more and more now? And if, if, it, if it's true, what can we do? Oh, that's a fabulous question. I'll see if you guys have a take on that too. But in my observation, so I first started, um, I was first elected in 2004, and even from then until now, I've noticed a hardening, like binary polarity between what's going through. And even so that if you talk to people individually, they may be in one place. And one of the downsides about, you know, party discipline or party caucus is suddenly you'll find people at the snap of a finger that can be pulled into line. Um, you know, for example, I just had to pull myself off of a bill today because I was told that if my name's on it, it can't pass the House. And so because it's a sentencing reform bill that I believe very strongly about on, on possession issues, I'm going to have a different Democrat's name on it. You know, and so these things do actually play into what's there. But this is a, a very good question because one of the things that can break that, one of the default places besides lobbyists controlling this can be the party structure itself. And you as a constituent, especially, I would recommend don't come in and say, hi, I'm a registered Democrat, Republican, unaffiliated. Frankly, that's not the best way to get your message. I am a constituent. I live in your district. And let's talk policy. Constituents can break that through because they, and the natural pull is going to be someone is going to want to be responsive. And there's a, a stronger urge to actually respond to what's there. So one of the best ways to break that kind of um, polarization that comes through is the more regular people that they hear from in their district, they're going to be more willing to break party ranks and say, I hear you, but i got to represent my district. And when you see people break ranks, it's because they've generally had a lot of constituent input. Uh, let's see other questions. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm real uh, interested in mentalities of liberals and conservatives. You mentioned that conservatives typically don't like to have regulations. From your inside viewpoint, how else can you label liberals and conservatives so that we might get to them in non-partisan ways? That's a great question. Um, so I think how you talk about things really matters. Let me give you an example on working on HOAs. Uh, so I walk my district every year. You hit people of all different political parties, and the first thing out of your mouth isn't, hi, I'm a political party. It's, you know, what issue is important to you? Well, I, so it's a good example. I went through all that and realized, wow, wait, this is strange. Like one out of five houses, we've got people coming up with HOA issues. And realized a bunch of them are Democrats, a bunch of them are unaffiliated, a bunch of them are Republicans. And you know what? There were some similar issues. We want access to our documents. You know, we think we're having some issues. And um, so how to approach that is a bill. Um, so I ran a massive homeowner's bill of rights in 2005. It was a pretty heavy lift that added dozens of new rights for property owners. And I didn't have all my Democrats with me. I didn't have all the Republicans. It absolutely required a mixture of Democrats and Republicans. So uh, related to the point I was making earlier about knowing each particular person, for some of the Republicans when I was talking to, I was talking about a fundamental property right. Who owns this property? You 
or is there a collective out there that actually has more power? They have, they can tax, they can seize, they can tell you what to do with your property. So a private property rights angle was very compelling to some. For others, it might have been um, Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility issues of I have an HOA that isn't accommodating here. And so when you're talking about fundamental democracy, these are you know micro governments. And so things like elections, shouldn't it have things like transparency and open records? And so the conversation, depending on you know depending on which legislator you're working from, they're not going to all equally care about each of the issues. You know, if I start talking to what was Jim Welker at the time about fundamental democracy in an HOA, he's going to tune me out and think I'm a Fruit Loop. I start talking to him about private property rights and that that's part of the founding of this country and, you know, you start to have a different conversation. So I think it's the best exercise to just simply use synonyms. You, you cater to, you, you know your issue, but, I mean, you've you got to speak a language of policy. And there are some buzzwords that will inherently tip people off on both sides. And so some of it is really working with language. I mean, you can use those buzzwords in a, in a persuasive way. Like you may know that if I start talking, if I'm talking to a Republican, I may emphasize free market aspects of something more than I might if I'm talking to a fellow Democrat. But um, if you don't customize your message, you're going to lose people. And if you do use straight up, pol you know, party talk on this, you've closed the door without any chance of getting it bipartisan. Well, and the language of populism is sometimes something that can transcend, too. Um, sometimes when you get into sort of little guy versus big guy stuff, it doesn't always fall on straight party line stuff. Other questions? Yes? Yes, to each of you, how do you explain lack of viability of third parties? That is a great question. I think the law itself, by having triggers of minimum threshold, makes it, uh, that's one barrier to third parties. Um, and as you know, we were talking a little bit before this too, but I think a winner-take-all system is a disincentive for third parties um, because the current system basically would make some people feel that they're throwing away their vote. And so there are other alternatives. Um, you know, our state law can look at things as, as to removing barriers about certain thresholds that are so high that it makes it hard for third parties to get in and compete on the ballot the same way. But we could also have a conversation about a winner-take-all system. There are other alternatives to that, but those are two legal things that wind up having the effect of limiting the development of strong third parties. We do have some, but they're kind of hitting a ceiling, if you will, about as far as they can go, probably under the current law. So I think we have time for two more quick questions, and then we'll go to the signing. So yes, you up front, and then you right behind. A lot of things be everything from my point of view, is out of balance with the lobbyists. As representatives, can you put a little bit of a boundary about how many lobbyists you see and, and how much time they take and, and so forth? Well, yes, we can. Um, let me tell you, that comes with a price. Um, so very quickly, um, one of my very first run-ins on the professional paid lobby corps is that um, I started my very first year in the House, um, I don't take lobbyist cards. And what that means, the language comes with the lobby is really where they sit outside the floor when we're uh, voting and amending. Typically, they'll send a note in. They'll tell you they want you to come out. People get up and leave off the floor in the middle of voting and debating and go get lobbied on some unrelated stuff. And I will tell you, they miss votes and they get it wrong and they get confused and they think they're voting on other bills. And, and so right away, no one, this was one of the things no one ever talked to me about. I'm like, wait a minute, I can't do that. I'm here. This bill is getting amended. It's getting debated. It may change. I have to pay attention to this. I honestly can't multitask. So my boundary has always been, but it is not true for everybody else. I will not be lobbied on the floor, whether it's second readings or third readings. My job then is to debate and hear the bill. Now, that is a personal choice, and when you are looking at candidates and trying to decide who you prefer, this is a good question to ask about what their philosophy is on this. I am willing to meet with everybody. I have my biases like everybody else. So I am more interested in getting appointments with regular constituents, with regular people. A, an unpaid visitor to me has more necessary information generally than a paid visitor is going to have. But I can set up office hours. I can meet. We really have a lot of control. Now, granted, as soon as I put that card up, 
I mean, the threats, you're never going to get elected again, you're never going to see another dime, and then you get a reputation as far as being someone that's very difficult to work on and so forth. So if you care about the other issues you're trying to do, some of those boundaries, depending on where you set them, can actually have consequences on the bills you do overall. But instead of letting this be done behind the scenes, I think that is an honest and open question to ask anyone while they're running, before they're running, before they're in office, what would your policy be? Um, and, you know, obviously you guys have a role, but we have a role too. We need filters, <laughs> and we have to ask ourselves, in my opinion, on any given bill, who's not at the table? I'll tell you, I spend a lot of my time fighting for empty seats about people who don't necessarily have a presence, and it's harder to recognize who's not there sometimes than just simply a contest between those that are there. Ken, I think you were there and SIG, and then we'll have to, based on timing, so we'll take your two questions quickly. And um, now, now, brief background, I have uh, lived in a multitude of other states, uh, Maryland, North Carolina, Florida, now Colorado. This is the first district I have ever lived in that I have the actual ability to have an open forum with my representatives. I consider that a very positive thing and a little bit flabbergasted that it hasn't been really done anywhere else. I kind of want to know, uh, is this a state-specific thing? Is this a district-specific thing? And if not, um, what is it going to take to allow other Coloradans to have the same privilege that I do to have this kind of access? So we're biased because we love you because you show up at our town hall meetings. But um, <laughs> It's an Arapahoe County thing. <laughs> so it, it does happen to be because we have an awesome delegation, but... But I think it's expectations, because if you have an elected official that doesn't hold town meetings, why not? It should call with an absolute expectation. When do you hold your town hall meetings? When can I meet with you? It shouldn't be if you do it, and sooner or later we change the culture. When I first started doing this in the House, we didn't have a ton of people doing town hall meetings in the House. We had even fewer. When I switched from the House to the Senate, it was even less part of the Senate culture, and Erica here can tell you exactly what her life in the Senate was like on that, too, on doing outreach. It's a cultural change, and so it's growing. The good news is it's growing. I'm less familiar with what's going on in other states, but I think feeling the, the, the confidence to come in and expect that, look, we all have a right to have people who are accessible. It's part of our responsibility to do community education. And if, and, and if you have somebody that represents you that is not doing this, call, ask why the power of expectation. When are your meetings? When can I show up? How do I ex access you? And we're right in a dynamic place where it's not universal. Um, but there is kind of a little bit of a shaming factor when other people realize, like, well, so we happen to do two town hall meetings a month, and so now people have grown from one into doing two, and we even have some folks that do three town hall meetings when for a long time the expectation was zero because it's easier and you don't have to put yourself out there and wonder if people are going to show up and tell you they hate you or your bills or whatever. But um, So I don't think it's universal. But I think it's growing, and we're doing our part. I bug my Senate colleagues. When are your town hall meetings? I want to see town hall meetings. I'm our caucus chair in the Senate. You better. This is part of your job. This is not optional. This is part of your job. Okay, Sid, you get our last question. Just an observation. The word empowerment. You are empowering people who do not feel empowered. You mentioned what you and I think that that's what the town, a piece of that is a town meeting, because you're giving people an empowerment. A, a time to be to speak and to also be aware of the fact that there's somebody listening. Yeah. And I think that um, the one other comment I would have about that is money. And power is related to money. There's no way we can get away from it. And that lobbyist who comes in, that's the way I see it. It's coming, if I were